So we had a really good time at camp meeting. I'll talk a little bit more about it in the next service, uh, just a little bit. Uh, but I tell you what, it was it was a blessing, and uh, those of you that were here uh, can attest to that. Those of you that could not make it, uh, um, I did at least our camp meetings. I recorded them, and hopefully by tomorrow I'll have them up on YouTube and so forth, so you'll have a chance to watch them um, and and hopefully get a blessing from it and and whatnot. But uh, it was it was mentioned. Uh, several times by the other preachers that the spirit here at the Old Fashioned Baptist Church uh, was just phenomenal and uh, I felt it and others felt it and uh, just the uh, the freedom to preach and uh, proclaim God's word it was uh, just a really good time and um, anyways those of you that could not make it I, I encourage you when we get them up on YouTube that you take time to to watch the messages and the specials and all that went on. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, and uh, we're talking about the elements of life and godliness. The last two weeks, we spent time to explain why this should be important to us. Uh, we saw that in verses 8 and beyond. Uh, in verse 8, he says, For if these things be in you and abound, uh, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he that lacketh these things, and we're going to be talking about these things in a moment, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, as opposed to being blind and forgetful, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, these things, if you do these things, ye shall never fall. What a promise. If you do these things, ye will never fall. And, uh, and then he talks about, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we talked about why we ought to do these things. Now, we didn't talk about the these things too clearly. And that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. We're talking about ultimately the, the overall context of the message is elements of of life and godliness. So I'll go ahead and pray, then we'll read the text that we're going to be looking at tonight, or this morning. Uh, Father, thank you again for meeting with us today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being a part of a church, uh, people, and a church group, and a family. Uh, Father, I pray that you meet with us in a powerful way. I pray that uh, if there be any spirits here today, uh, contrary to your word, that you would uh, whether they be devilish spirits that they might be casted out or whether they be the spirit within the human heart that is downtrodden, discouraged or uh, non-desirous of your truth I pray that you would change it uh, help us Father to have a service that is blessing uh, that is uh, an honor to you and, uh, and one that would praise and glorify and, and magnify you I pray in Jesus name Amen Alright, so taking it up to verse 1, <clears throat> the Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, this we have the introduction, uh, to them they have obtained like precious faith. And so he's speaking to believers, as we've seen the last two weeks, people who have like precious faith. And we took time to talk about the term precious. And this faith that you and I have is precious, is something that ought to be uh, held in high reverence, is something that we ought to, uh, to see as, uh, as special and, and blessed of God. Uh, but in addition to that, it's like precious faith, meaning very similar to the scripture that says that we have a common salvation. Uh, all of us have a like precious faith, if you're saved, and that's the key. This is talking to the people who are born again. Uh, so he's speaking to them that have obtained like precious faith with us, talking about the apostles and the people that Peter is with, uh, through, where do we get this like, like precious faith? Through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And so again, we see the importance of the knowledge of of God and of Jesus our Lord. We'll be talking a little bit about that in the next service, actually. Uh, but grace and peace be multiplied to you. This is Peter's desire as he's writing this epistle, that the people reading the epistle, that the grace and peace of God would be multiplied to them. And this is done through the knowledge and of, our, of God and of Jesus our Lord. The reason why many people are walking in this world without 
that grace and peace be multiplied is because they do not have the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He goes on and says in verse 3, According as His divine power hath given, this is key, His divine power hath given unto us, what's the next word? All. all. Okay, so He's given us all things that pertain or belong to or are part of that pertain unto life and godliness. That's where we get the title of this lesson, Elements of Life and Godliness. God has given His saved people, His children, everything that pertains unto life and godliness. Not too much unlike the Scripture that says that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through, here it is again, the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. And so again, we see this key is it's through the knowledge. It's not, it's through God, it's through Jesus Christ, but it's through the knowledge of him. It's through knowing him and having knowledge of him. He says in verse 4, whereby, talking about the saints, us, who've been given the things that pertain unto life and godliness, whereby are given unto us exceeding, exceeding great and precious promises that by these, what? These promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, you are saved. You're going to heaven when you die. The Bible says you are a new creature. The Bible says all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Uh, but just because you're saved doesn't mean you're partaking in that salvation. In other words, you're going to heaven when you die. You have faith. That's the foundation. Uh, but we're going to see in a little while, he says, add to your faith. Uh, and you might say, and this is what we talked about the last two weeks, you might say, well, why do I need to add anything to my faith? Isn't my faith good enough? Well, if you're talking about going to heaven, the answer is yes, your faith is good enough. Your faith in God, that is. You know, a lot of people put their faith in things that they ought not to. But putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what must I do to be saved? Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Amen. Uh, we find that, uh, uh, they, uh, what was it, Peter, I think? Maybe it was Paul. I think it was Peter was asked the question, uh, Sirs, what, you know, uh, what must I do to be saved? And he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's faith. That's all you need to go to heaven. Amen. But if you want to take the next step with God, you need to add to your faith. It needs to be more than that. And so if you want to be partakers of this divine nature, but not just have it by proxy, not just have it by, uh, by benefit of being saved, but actually partake in it, actually, uh, as the Bible says, work out your salvation, work out your own salvation, fair and trembling, if you actually want to have something be made of it, then we need to add to our faith. And so he says we've been given precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having what? Escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. You understand, as Romans teaches us, sin shall have no more dominion over us, and we're told that we can reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin. We are able to escape the corruption of this world and the corruption that comes through the lust of this world, or through, the, uh, through lust. And then he says, besides all this, verse 5, giving all diligence... Add to your faith. And then he gives us a list of things that we need to add. We add to our faith virtue. And then once we have virtue, we add to our virtue knowledge. Once we have knowledge that's been added to virtue, that's been added to faith, we add temperance. And then to temperance, we add patience. And to patience, we add godliness. And to godliness, we add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, we add charity. And then we have the passage that we've been talking about the last two weeks. For if these things be in you, then you have these promises. So today I want to talk to you about this faith. We're going to be adding to faith, but I want to talk about faith today. And so faith uh, in Christianity is distinct from other faith. Uh, and we've talked about this to some degree already, and that is you can have faith in a lot of things. Uh, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, and that is too many people, they have faith in faith. In other words, how many times have I heard someone say, well, you just got to have faith. That's true to a point. In other words, people put their faith in the stock market. 
And that might be fine in the financial realm, but that stock market could fail you, you know. Uh, they put their faith in their jobs. Your job could fail you or whatever. They put their faith in their, their, their good health. You know, they exercise and they eat right. They do all these things. And, and so they put their, their faith in the fact that I'm a healthy specimen of a human being. But you have some cancerous cell growing inside of you. And now your faith has been misplaced. You put your faith in a lot of things, and, and not everything that we put our faith in is bad. I put my faith in my wife. My wife puts her faith in me. But when it comes to real importance of what you're going to do with your life, and uh, whether or not you're going to have God's blessing on you, your faith needs to be in God. If you're going to go to heaven when you die, your faith needs to be in God. If you're going to have God's blessing on your life, your faith needs to be in God. And so the difference between the Christian world and the non-Christian world when it comes to faith is the distinctness of the fact that we're putting our faith in an authority. We're putting our faith in the supreme being. We're putting our faith in someone or some, uh, someone who is higher than us. And so this faith that I have, I can say for me, has made a difference in my life. And you might want to ask yourself, has the faith that you have, has it made a difference in your life? You know, while we were at these camp meetings at different times, they would ask for testimonies and people would give a testimony. And a couple times they asked specifically for testimonies of people's salvation, of when they got saved. And, and uh, heard a lot of good testimonies of people talking about when they got saved. One of the preachers, uh, while he was preaching, he was sharing some of his testimony. He, he pretty much grew up in church. And I, uh, uh, he was, I think he was a deacon and a Sunday school teacher and so forth. And, and, uh, and all this time he thought that he was saved. And, and, uh, and God started speaking to him about this thing. And, and one day he realized that he wasn't saved. And here he was, a deacon and a Sunday school teacher and saying all the right words and knowing all the right stuff, but he never made it real for himself. And, and so one day they were having a meeting. The pastor and a couple of the deacons was at the church having a meeting, if I understand his testimony properly. And he came down, or maybe it was at the end of a service, I think is what it was. And he came down and the pastor asked him, do you have a prayer request? And he says, no, I need to be saved. And the pastor was shocked, you know, because he looked like a Christian, he talked like a Christian, he acted like a Christian, but he wasn't saved. But when he got saved and he truly got born again, that faith that he put in Christ, I mean, it was a world of difference for him. Uh, he wasn't saved out of drunkenness, he was saved out of religion and religiosity. Whereas we had another pastor there that gave his testimony and how that he, I don't know what he did, but he was in prison for doing something. And while in prison, someone reached him with the gospel and he got saved. And his faith in Christ made a difference. And now he's no longer in prison. And now he's, he's married. He's got a family. And he's pastoring a church in Williamsburg, PA, I think is the church. Williams, uh, no, no. Well, it doesn't matter. But he's somewhere in Pennsylvania. You know, pastoring a church and, and, uh, and, and serving God. Why? Because this faith that he put in Christ. You see, when you put your faith in Christ, it makes a difference. And the faith that we have is distinct in that very, very case. And in my life, I can tell you, and I'm not going to stories with you, but the difference that it's made. And so, the next question we should ask ourselves, though, is what are some of the things that you've done? Using your faith. You see, the bedrock of Christianity, the bedrock of our belief is that we must have faith. I was listening to, uh, watching a video on YouTube the other day of a, uh, a scientist, a mathematician, uh, and uh, in the sciences and so forth, and Oxford University and whatnot. He's a born-again Christian. And uh, he says, I have no problem as a scientist believing that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He says, I have no problem as a scientist believing in, uh, believing in creation and whatnot. Now, some of the things he said I wasn't completely in agreement with, but I appreciated his testimony. And, uh, and he ended up having a debate with another professor there at the college who was, a, I think, a physicist and, uh, and a, an outspoken atheist. And uh, it was an interesting conversation between the two. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, one of the things that he said uh, in that debate was, everybody has faith. Even atheists have faith. 
Scientists have faith. And of course, this atheist, he kind of shook his head. No, we don't. No, we don't. And then about halfway through the debate, the atheist says something to the fact of, well, we don't know this for sure, but we believe that this is how things are. And he's like, there you go. You have faith. You put your faith in something that you don't know the answer to. And so everybody has faith. But the truth is, the bedrock of Christianity is that we must have faith. And we must have faith in God. And so here he speaks of this uh, adding to our faith. But before he does that, he talks about this like precious faith. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. There's different types of faith in the Bible. Uh, there's certainly the terminology that we use sometimes, saving faith. Romans 5, 1, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a conclusion to an argument that Paul was making with the people there at Rome, specifically the Jews, and how that Abraham received righteousness by faith and not by the deeds of the law. And furthermore, nobody has ever received righteousness by doing or keeping the law. They've all ultimately failed. And the only way someone will obtain righteousness is by faith. And specifically that faith being in God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It takes faith to call upon the name of the Lord. And he says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. 1 John chapter 5. You can go ahead and turn your Bibles there. 1 John chapter 5. And uh, one of my favorite passages, I love to use this passage when I'm talking to especially new believers and explaining to them what they got in salvation. But in 1 John in chapter 5 and verse 11, the Bible says, and this is the record. Now, the this that's being referred to is talking about what John is writing. And certainly, we can make an application to the Word of God itself. But this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Uh, you've heard this illustration before, but a, 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 a young couple, they had just gotten married maybe. Uh, a month or so after they were married, the, the wife woke up one morning and she was obviously sad and so forth, maybe crying a little bit. And the husband was trying to comfort her. And any of you out there that's ever been in that position, you know that's a very hard position to be in because it's hard to tell why they're crying. You know, but uh, uh, the husband was trying to comfort her. And what's wrong, honey? And she all of a sudden, she said, I just don't feel married. What do you mean you don't feel married? We just got married a month ago. I just don't feel married. And so he got out of bed, went to the cedar chest, opened up the cedar chest, and pulled out of the cedar chest a document, uh, which was their marriage license, and said, see right here, it says we're married. Now, I don't know if that's a true story, but it's an interesting illustration. She didn't feel like she was married, but they had proof that they were married. You may not always feel saved. And I made a little ditty about this and that is sometimes people laugh when uh, let's see here people cry when they're happy they laugh when they're sad don't trust your feelings or you'll be had you know and uh, you may not always feel saved but may I say to you that this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life what life eternal life it's in his son it's not in what George Philip Clark Jr. does. It's not in what these girls do here. It's not in what you do. It's in what Jesus did. This life is in His Son. Verse 12, He goes on and says, He that hath the Son hath life. At the age of 10, I trust that Christ is my Savior. And as a result, He became mine and I became His. He that hath the Son hath life. And the context is the life is talking about eternal life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's either you got him or you don't. You're either saved or you're not saved. There's no in-between. Okay? Right. You either trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior or you didn't trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's either yours or he's not yours. And if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. That's faith. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Why did I write these things to you, he says? That ye may know that ye have eternal life. Amen. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Amen. You say that's kind of circular. Yeah, it is. 
basically, he wrote these things so that you, if you believe on the name of the Son of God, he wrote this to you. So that two things, actually, if we follow the scriptures further, there's several things he wants you to know, but we'll stop with that. But on this verse, two things. So that number one, you would know that you have eternal life. I don't stand here before you today hoping so. I don't stand here before you today fretting about it. I'm not worried. If I were to die today, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I'm going to heaven when I die. One of the preachers, I think Thursday night uh, during camp meeting, he preached the message, are you sure that you're born again? And I was able to say, yes, I'm sure. You understand, since the age of 10 and trusting Christ as my Savior, I've never doubted my salvation once. Not once. Why? Because I know that I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. How do I know that? The Word of God says so. It said how to be saved. I did what it says. God doesn't lie, so I'm saved. The Bible says in the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. I know I'm saved. Amen. My wife, her testimony, she got saved somewhere around the age of seven or so. She went off to Bible college. Uh, she only went for a year for various reasons. She had to go home, and it had a lot to do with uh, family reasons and whatnot, but nonetheless, she went for a year to Bible college. I think it was Crown College, and um, I might get the story a little bit mixed up, but I'm pretty sure. I'm the, I guess I won't mention the pastor's name. Maybe I should. I'll leave it alone. Uh, but anyways, the, there was a church service, and the pastor's, I think his daughter-in-law, uh, came forward uh, saying that she was doubting her salvation and she wasn't saved. And, uh, and so the pastor said in the invitation time, he says that it's okay that she's doubting her salvation. And she, he further said, if you've never doubted your salvation, I doubt you're even saved. What a stupid, unbiblical, undoctrinal, devilish thing to say. If you've never doubted your salvation, I doubt you're even saved. And my wife, she never doubted her salvation until he said that. And so she was taught that the pastor's never wrong and whatever he says is always right. She struggled with that thing for years until on our day of our first anniversary, we sat on our bed talking about it. And I said, well, just in case, let's just go ahead and settle it right now. And so she prayed and asked Jesus to save her. And the next Sunday, she went forward in church got baptized. But in her heart of hearts, she does believe that at the age of seven is when she got saved. And that pastor just kind of messed with her head a little bit. I believe if you doubt your salvation, you're probably not saved. I mean, there's a good chance of that. But if you're saved, there's no reason to doubt your salvation. Either God's true or He's not true. Man. If you're doubting your salvation, it's because you weren't trusting Him. You were trusting yourself. You were trusting something else. You were trusting what someone else said. These girls, I'm glad you're here. Some of you uh, made a profession of faith when you were younger. Going to our church, you know, before we lost the Van Rock for a while. And some of you trusted Christ the Savior here at this church when you were little kids. I want you to know that if that was true, if you really did get saved, you're still saved. It hasn't changed. But if you just prayed a prayer because some, some adult told you you need to pray a prayer, that's not good enough. You need to put your personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ and not trust some experience, but trust the Word of God and trust God Himself. Amen. But if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, well, you're saved. And so he says, I wrote these things that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe. What does that mean? I already believe on the name of the Son of God. Why did you write this? So that I might know that I have eternal life and that I might believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can keep it there. You, you, you put your faith in Him once to trust Him for salvation. He's writing these things so that you can know that you can continue to believe Him. You can continue to trust Him. Not continue to trust Him in the sense that I need to trust Him every day for salvation. That's a done deal. But I need to trust Him every day for everyday life. Do I not? And if I can't trust Him for salvation, I de dead sure can't trust Him for anything else. But may I say to you, if I can trust Him to keep me from hell and take me to heaven when I die, then there's absolutely zero reason I can't trust Him for everything else. Alright, so we say saving faith. Let's talk about... Uh, seeking faith. A few Sundays ago, I preached a message on seek. Or actually, I think it was last week. I preached a message on seek Him. But in Hebrews chapter 11, you turn there. It's a well-known passage. Many of you will know it. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now faith, all right, we're talking about faith and Peter, he says that we have like precious faith. That's referring to our foundational faith in Jesus Christ. 
Peter says we need to add to this faith, and we'll talk about those elements next week. But regarding faith, it says now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I've talked about this before, but faith is tangible in the sense that it's based on evidence. It's based on substance. Now, substance of things that we hope for. And the word hope, biblically speaking, nine times well, biblically speaking, the word hope is dealing with a, an assured, uh, a, 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 an assured uh, expectation of something to come. In other words, it's not the same kind of hope that you might have uh, on Christmas morning. Boy, I hope I got this you know, particular thing from my parents kind of thing. It's, it's a hope in the sense of I know it's going to happen. I just don't know when. And so faith is the substance of things that's hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. I gave this illustration before. I guess I could give it again. I don't know if this is working. Let's see. And uh, Okay, it's good enough. Uh, so hopefully this will be a blessing to you. Those of you that have seen this illustration before, it won't really matter, I guess. Uh, but if you could just imagine with me that you're on a burning building. You know, you're at the top floor. I mean, you're on the roof. And the flames are all around. The smoke is ascending very high. You can't see. You can't see anything. You can, you can barely tell what's going on. You're choking and so forth. You can't get down. And all of a sudden, you hear in the distance sirens. You now have a hope for things not seen. You don't see the, the fire trucks, but you hear them coming. And so hope is there. And you believe that they're coming to rescue you. Faith. They get there and they can't get the fire out too well. And so next thing you know, you hear someone on a bullhorn. You can't see him, but you hear him. And he says to you, uh, we, we have a net down here. And, uh, and we've done this before. We know what we're doing. But you only have one option. You either stay there and die in the flames or you jump. And we'll catch you. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, right? And so it's going to take faith. Your faith is your evidence of the things not seen and the things that you hope for. And so by faith, you believe the voice that you cannot hear. You believe there's a net that you cannot see. But it's based on some evidence of the fact that they're a fire company. They obviously should know what they're doing. And so you're trusting him that he knows what he's doing. And you jump. And it's scary. But then you land safe and sound. Now you have experience. If you catch yourself on a fiery building in the future and you find yourself in the same scenario and you hear the same voice saying jump, you might not pause as long because you have experience to go with your faith. He's proven to be there for you before. It's the same thing with God. We have faith in God and sometimes it might, it might be a little scary but once we start to experience that faith and put that faith into practice and put that faith to the test and actually step out on that faith, eventually it gets easier and easier to trust Him for things. And so, in our Hebrews passage, it says, Now faith is the, su faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds are framed by the Word. Of God, so the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. That was based on his faith. You understand that he obtained witness that he was righteous, not based on some work. Uh, it continues, God testifying of his gifts, uh, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Here's key, for before his translation, he had this testimony. What was Enoch's testimony? <clears throat> that he pleased God. That's what it says. That he pleased God. And then verse 6 tells us, but without faith. Can we please God without faith? No, no we can't. <laughs> Uh, I don't have time to park on something. I, I'm a little, I'm a little ticked right now because of a Facebook post that I saw, and uh, I wish I had time to park on it. How many of you know who? How many know who Snoop Dogg is? Snoop Dogg. Okay, he's a rapper. He uh, he boasts about the fact that he was a pimp in real life, as opposed to you know what a pimp is. Uh, but anyways, he boasts about the fact that he was a pimp in real life. 
Uh, whereas the other rappers, they just take on that persona. He was an actual pimp, basically. He sold women for sex. And, uh, and then uh, he gave up pimping because he wants to spend more time with his family. <laughs> but uh, he, he's involved in all kinds. And in, in 2018, he put out a Christian album called The Bible of Love. He even played at a, uh, at a Christian uh, uh, music festival and so forth. At one time, he was part of the Nation of Islam, and he praised Louis Farrakhan. Then he became a Raffetarian, I think is the term, which is a, a Jamaican uh, 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 witchcraft-type religion. And now he says that he's always believed in Jesus Christ as a Savior. And so these people are talking about the fact that isn't this great? Now, now here's the thing. 2018, he came out with that song. 2019, he's back doing the other stuff too. Okay. I mean, he's still doing uh, rap music. He's still having girls on his videos that, you know, have no clothes or hardly and so forth. He's still doing all this stuff. He's still doing drugs and everything. He hasn't changed anything. And there's all these Christians praising him. And there's all these Christians saying that, that other so-called Christians judging people for their past. Well, we're not talking about his past. We're talking about his present. May I say to you, it is impossible to please God without faith. It is impossible to worship God in holiness while you're living unholy. It's impossible to say that you're doing something for the cause of God when you're living for the cause of Satan. It's impossible. And so don't be sucked in just because some person starts singing a, a Christian so-called song doesn't make them Christian. You need to hold them to their true self. But anyways... He says uh, here, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, this is talking about seeking faith, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder than that diligently seek him. You have to have faith if you're going to come to God. You're going to have to have faith if you're going to seek him. You're going to have to have faith if you want to see that reward that God has for you. You're going to have to have faith if you want to have answered prayer. You're going to have to have faith if you're going to want to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. You have to have faith if you're going to climb up in a sycamore tree like Zacche uh, uh, Zacchaeus did. You're going to have to have faith if you're going to cry out like blind Bartimaeus. You're going to have to have faith if you're going to seek him for anything. It's going to take faith. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord. Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. Too many of us Christians, I'm guilty sometimes too. We spend too much time leaning on our own understandings. He says don't do that. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understandings and all thy ways. Everything we do, we need to acknowledge Him. And the result is He'll direct our paths. We also have a seeing faith in Isaiah 2. I need to rush through this. I did not mean for this to become a two-parter, but it looks like it's going to be. Um, not Isaiah 2, Isaiah 26. It says in verses 3 and 4, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusteth in thee. How many of you would like to be kept in perfect peace? <laughs> Wouldn't you love to have the peace of God that passeth all understanding that the New Testament teaches about? Philippians teaches us. Isaiah, speaking here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that God will keep the person in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God. Where's your mind at tonight? This morning. It'll be night by the time we're done, right? Where's your, where's your mind at? It's not going to be night when we're done. But where's your mind at? What, what are you focusing your mind on? What's your attention Who's got your attention? What's got your attention? Is it God? Has He arrested your attention? He says those whose mind has stayed on God, those are the ones that will have perfect peace because they trust in God. Verse 4, He says, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Again, over in Hebrews, this time chapter 12, we're told in verses 1 and 2. I'll just read it. Some of you can quote it. You're welcome to turn there. Obviously, I never discourage that. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also come past about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, we just read a little bit of Hebrews chapter, chapter 11. And he, the, what, the little bit that we read in Hebrews chapter 11, it mentions a few people. It mentions Abel. It mentions uh, uh, Enoch. Uh, anyway, and then the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, we have a long list of people who put their faith and trust in God. And Hebrews chapter 12 was talking about those people. Now, 
there may be new, new people added to the list. You know, people that's died in our lifetime, for instance. But he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, they're watching. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our what? Faith. Faith. Who, talk about Jesus, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says we're running a race. I, uh, I played sports growing up. I wasn't into track. I, I didn't like running unless I had to. And of course, some sports you had to run, right? But you know, just the idea of running in circles didn't appeal to me. And, uh, but you all are familiar with track and so forth, and maybe you're familiar with the baton race, you know, where you have usually I think it's three groups. You have the, the, the first group goes, then you have a, the next group, and then the next group, and the last one is the one that's supposed to pull it in, right? And the way it works, probably don't have to tell you this, you're running with the baton, and as you get near your spot where you're ending, the person you're supposed to pass the baton on to starts running in front of you with his hand like this, or her hand like this. And the idea is that you're supposed to hand the baton to them. And once you hand the baton to them, you're done. You did your part. And then that person runs until they pass the baton to the one waiting on them. And then you're done. You, do, you did your part. Well, we have a whole bunch of people in Hebrews 11 who ran their race. Some ran it very well. Some ran it mediocre. We have a whole bunch of people that's not in Hebrews 11 that ran the race and ran it horribly. And so on and so forth. And so they're now all sitting in the grandstands and as it were, they pass the baton down through the ages until it finally got to us. And they're watching us run our race. And some of them are cheering us saying, please don't mess up like I did. Can you imagine here you are the runner and you trip and fall and you get up, you skin your knee and you run some more and you finally hand off the baton and you hope the person you handed it to did a better job than you did? Right? Or you did really, really well and you beat the other people that was on your opposing team and you hand the baton and you hope the person you hand the baton to doesn't mess it up and ruin all the work that you did. Well, that's what's going on right now. There's a great, great cloud of witnesses and they're watching us and some of them are hoping that we do better than they did and some of them are hoping that we don't do worse than they did or we do as good as they did. The point is, you've been given the baton you're supposed to run with it. In order to run with it, you've got to lay aside weights and the sin that's so easy to beset us. And you have to be looking on the prize. You have to be looking on the author and finisher of our faith, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. But that takes faith. And so we saw saving faith, seeking faith, seeing faith, and I'm going to have to go ahead and stop it there. And it looks like we're going to have a two-parter on this faith. But uh, we're going to be adding to our faith virtue and all these other things. But first we're going to lay our foundation of faith. But why do we do this? Because those who add these things, those who have these things, they have the promises that we find in verses 8 to 14 and so forth. And certainly that's important. So God bless you. It's 1048. You've got 12 minutes before the next service.